All right. So good morning, everyone. And welcome to our seventh uh, webinar in the series of ticks and tick-borne pathogens open community webinar series. My name is Anna Maria Nievidomska, and I work for the viral side of the bacterial and viral um, bioinformatics resource centers. And today I'll be talking to you about comparative genomics of flaviviridae in ticks. Um, so um, I'll just go over the logistics of this webinar just very quickly um, so that <clears throat> we can give other participants a chance to join in. Um, and I apologize for my voice this morning. It's a little bit croaky, um, getting over a cold, but hopefully um, it holds out till the end of the webinar. So this is being recorded um, and uh, will be available on the vupathdb.org website um, at this link, uh, this address over here. Um, as I said, this is part of an entire webinar series on uh, ticks and their pathogens, and that includes eukaryotic pathogens, um, the vectors that transmit them, viruses, and bacterial pathogens that are transmitted by ticks. Um, we have one more um, webinar left in the series in addition to uh, today's, and that will be on June the 14th um, on RNA-seq and SNP analysis of bacteria transmitted by ticks, and that will be presented by uh, my colleague Rebecca. And if you haven't registered for that, you can go ahead and do that um, there. Um, and if you'd like to watch any of the other uh, previous webinars, you can find them uh, at this on this page as well. So today I thought I would just give you a quick overview of the BVBRC and the viruses that uh, we'll be talking about. And then I thought we could move on to uh, the website itself and go through some use cases. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of time left at the end for some Q&A and discussion. Um, so just real quick, if you're not already familiar with um, the BVBRC or the Bioinformatic Resource Centers, um, we've been around for quite a while, but our sites have taken different forms. Um, most recently, we've merged uh, several of our databases into um, two databases, um, the eukaryotic pathogen database and the vector database have merged into VUPathDB. And this hosts data on um, eukaryotic pathogens and their vectors. Um, on the other hand, uh, we are part of the BVBRC. And um, the new website, uh, if you're not already familiar with it, is a joint production um, and emerging of the previous sites, um, which include the Patrick database, which uh, focuses on bacterial pathogens, and um, the IRD, the Influenza Research Database, and the Virus Pathogen Resource, which have both historically been focused on viral pathogens. You can find all of the same information um, in addition to new viral groups and new tools at our new website at bvbrc.org. Um, so if you're wondering what kind of uh, tick-borne pathogens you can find, um, there's quite a few bacterial tick-borne pathogens, and my colleague Rebecca has gone over some of these, um, and there's uh, quite a few of these, and you can go ahead and browse them and explore them on our site. Uh, my focus, however, is on viral pathogens, and we focus on several viral families that span uh, the different types of viruses, such as single-stranded um, RNA viruses and double-stranded DNA viruses, uh, things like that. Um, and from these, we have several viral families that are transmitted by ticks. My previous webinar was on the Bunia viralis order, which has multiple viral families transmitted by ticks. Um, and you can watch that, as I said, on um, the website. But today I thought I would talk about flaviviruses since they're quite different um, and it, 
in particular, I'll be talking about a use case with tick-borne encephalitis virus. And there's quite a few genome segments, so there's a lot of data to explore. Um, and I would encourage you to do that uh, yourself if you're interested in other uh, tick-borne viral families. So <clears throat> uh, I thought I would just give you a quick introduction to the flavivirus um, family. These are RNA viruses that mainly infect uh, mammals and birds. They're primarily spread by arthropod vectors. And you're probably familiar with, um, and most people are probably familiar with those spread by mosquitoes, such as dengue virus, yellow fever virus. But tick-borne flaviviruses are less well-known, uh, but still quite important both uh, to humans and agriculturally. Uh, the Flaviviridae family is divided into four genera, Flavivirus, Hepasivirus, Pegivirus, and Pestivirus. Um, but the majority of the tick-borne viruses belong uh, to the Flavivirus genus. Only one of them uh, can be found in the Hepasivirus uh, genus, which mainly um, has hepatitis uh, C virus in it. There are a few unclassified tick-borne viruses that still haven't uh, been assigned a genus, but most of these are related to the flavivirus uh, genus. Um, so I thought I would give you just a quick list of what uh, species uh, in the flavivirus genus are known to be transmitted by ticks. Um, and these include uh, <laughs> a lot of viruses with very interesting uh, names like gadget scully virus, uh, Greek goat encephalitis virus, Chiasinor uh, forest disease virus, um, but probably the most studied and most well-known are Powassan virus, which can be found here in North America and some parts of Asia, and tick-borne encephalitis virus. And all of these are uh, somewhat related to each other phylogenetically, but um, we'll get into that uh, in a little bit uh, more detail later. Um, so if you're interested in what kind of ticks carry these flaviviruses, uh, it's more than just one specific species and uh, they can be divided into softback ticks um, in the Ornithodorus species and hardbacked uh, ticks. And multiple types of um, uh, ticks can carry this, can transmit the same virus. Um, so you can see, for example, al, al humra hemorrhagic fever uh, can be transmitted by both soft and hardback ticks. But uh, one of the most studied species is, um, or uh, some of the species that are most studied are in the Ixodes family, and uh, these can transmit a great many um, viruses. And here's a nice picture of a cute little. Um, sheep tick called Ixodes rinkus, and that happens to transmit uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus, which I'll be focused on today. Um, <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit of an idea on the characteristics of these flaviviruses themselves, um, as I mentioned, they're positive sense RNA viruses. Um, they have a single uh, strand. Uh, the viruses themselves are quite small. They're only about 40 to 60 nanometers in diameter, uh, and they are enveloped viruses. The virus genome itself um, is also quite short and compact. It's only about 10 to 11 kE, depending on the species. Uh, they have a five prime cap, and um, all the proteins are encoded in a single open reading frame. Uh, with three prime and five prime UTRs. And um, this open reading frame actually encodes 10 viral proteins, three of them uh, which are structural proteins that make up uh, the, the basic parts of the virus, including uh, the envelope, membrane, and capsid protein. And on the inside, we have the genomic RNA with some um, nice conserved structures on the five prime and three prime end. And, um, we also have seven uh, non-structural proteins that have uh, different um, functions, including um, genome replication and immun immunomodulatory uh, functions. Uh, so this is 
uh, just to give you a quick idea of what the genome of this virus looks like. Um, and this is the one uh, long open reading frame that we talked about, and it makes just one single long polyprotein. But uh, this polyprotein can then be cleaved into uh, multiple different uh, proteins or uh, mature peptides, as they're called. So here we've got our structural proteins, the, the capsid membrane and the envelope proteins. Um, and then we have uh, all the non-structural proteins that start with NS, like NS1, NS2A, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is just a quick overview of the phylogeny of these tick-borne um, flaviviruses. And as I mentioned, they're quite related to each other, but it also turns out that um, they cluster in terms of their genomic similarity, uh, depending on the vector that they're transmitted by. So over here, we have this nice cluster in red, and these are our tick-borne uh, virus complex. And these two down here uh, are transmitted by seabird tick-borne um, viruses. So um, these are restricted to um, birds and typically cause disease in birds, whereas these uh, infect mammals and occasionally um, they jump from uh, animals to humans. Um, and down here we have uh, our mosquito transmitted uh, viruses, which many of you um, are probably more familiar with, such as dengue virus and yellow fever virus and Zika. <clears throat> so um, I'll be talking today about tick-borne encephalitis virus. Um, generally, um, when people are infected with this virus um, as a result of being bitten by a tick, Symptoms are typically mild and some people are even asymptomatic, but occasionally uh, you end up with infection of cells in the central nervous system, and this can cause severe disease such as um, encephalitis, meningitis, and um, it can cause uh, other neurological symptoms and issues in patients. Uh, there's not many treatment uh, methods out there, and usually people are just given supportive uh, treatment. However, people have been experimenting with vaccines for a very long time, particularly in Europe uh, and in the Soviet Union, um, historically, and now Russia. Um, and there have been many different types of vaccines that have been developed. But, um, and in 2021, uh, the FDA approved one of these vaccines uh, for use in the United States. Um, so tick-borne encephalitis virus has quite a long history. It's been known about for almost 100 years uh, so far. And about 20 years ago, people believed that, um, or what was known about tick-borne virus, uh, based on how it clustered in a phylogenetic tree, was that um, there are about three different groups, or three main groups of tick-borne uh, encephalitis virus, one of which was the um, European group that mostly uh, was found in Europe, a Siberian group mostly found in um, Siberia, and Far Eastern group, which was found in some uh, Far East Asian uh, countries as well, uh, as well as um, Eastern Russia. Um, <clears throat> but since then, um, as this virus has grown, and as surveillance for this virus has grown, and um, particularly with um, climate warming, it's become more of a problem and with the spread of ticks into um, more geographic places, surveillance has increased and several new divergent um, tick-borne encephalitis virus strains have been found that fall outside of these uh, three main groups. For example, there were two divergent uh, tick-borne encephalitis viruses found um, in the Irkutsk region um, in 2016 in the Netherlands, um, a new uh, lineage of, or a new European subtype was found. And in 2018, uh, a very divergent uh, subtype was found in the Tibetan highlands that uh, didn't cluster with any of these three groups on the phylogenetic tree. Um, so I thought today we could go to the BVBRC website, um, take our time. I could show you how to look for 
a specific data set that you might be interested in exploring. Uh, we'll then, once we have our data set, we can um, use that to generate multiple sequence alignments. And this will be using our multiple sequence alignment and SNP analysis tool. After that, um, we can uh, use our multiple sequence alignment to generate a phylogenetic tree and explore for ourselves um, what the latest data and what the latest genomes in the tick-borne encephalitis uh, virus species look like, um, see if we can uh, see any kind of geographic uh, clustering. And we'll explore the phylogenetic tree builder tool to use this and our Archaeopteryx um, viewer to look at and explore our tree. And then finally, um, we'll try to compare uh, variations in a specific protein, for example, from uh, these three phylogenetic groups that I mentioned, the European, Siberian, and Far Eastern uh, groups. And this will uh, showcase our uh, Metacats tool. Um, so I will check if there's any questions. And if not, we can move on to um, the website demonstration. All right, looks like we're good. So let's just maximize the screen and make sure everybody can see. Looks good, yep. <laughs> All right, fantastic. <clears throat> So uh, if you haven't used the bvbrc.org website before, it's pretty easy to get to bv-brc.org. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, you can find all kinds of uh, data and information on both bacteria uh, and viruses. And we do also provide uh, information on archaea, but that's not uh, today's topic. Um, so there's many different types of bioinformatic data uh, and it's not just restricted to genomes and um, uh, protein data, but you can also find um, uh, metabolic data, protein structures, and a plethora of other things. And um, you can find that by just um, uh, clicking on uh, the specific um, pathogen you're interested in. And for me, that's viruses. And this will take you to the virus landing page. Um, and this gives you just a quick idea of what you can find in here in terms of uh, genomic data. Um, it tells you how many viral families we have, um, how many genomes or genome segments, proteins, um, protein structures. And they're divided, of course, into um, uh, the different types of Baltimore group uh, families. So over here, we have our single-stranded positive sense RNA, which is where I will find the Flaviviridae family. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Um, and this takes me to uh, the Flavi Verde landing page. And if you're lost, you can kind of just look up here and um, uh, the breadcrumbs will give you an idea of where you are in terms of um, the viral taxonomy, because this is the taxon view. But you can also um, flip through the different tabs and look at the different information that's associated with this virus family. So we've got taxonomy. If you want to browse through the different um, viral species that way, um, we've got all the different genomes. We've got uh, the proteins, protein structures, uh, domains and motifs, uh, epitopes, if you're interested in the immunological data. And um, we also do have some experimental data for some, but not all of the viral families. If there's something you're more um, specifically interested in, you can also just type it into this quick search box. Um, and you can either leave it uh, to the default all data types, and that will give you what you want. So for example, I could just do tick-borne encephalitis. And um, that will show me um, what's in the database. So I found. Uh, two matches underneath the taxa. One of them is tick-borne encephalitis virus, which is what I want. And one of them is chimeric tick-borne encephalitis virus or dengue virus 4, um, which is not uh, what I'm interested in. So um, that's how you can um, find the data that you're interested in. 
And this takes me again, if we follow the breadcrumbs, we can see the taxonomy of it. So we have the Flaviviridae family, the Flavivirus genus, and then over here, uh, the viral species that we're interested in, tick-borne encephalitis virus. So now I'm gonna flip to uh, the genomes tab, which will show me a list of uh, all of the genomes that are available in uh, the website. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is quite a long list um, and there's a lot to take in here, but um, it's actually uh, very easy to navigate through the data because all of the uh, metadata that we import from GenBank is here. Um, and in addition, we also add our own curation onto it so that we can uh, standardize and normalize the data, uh, making it more easy to for users to search so that they can search by geographic group, for example. Um, and you can get to that by clicking on the filters tab. And this will give you a way to just start putting together your data set based on um, <clears throat> based on uh, the metadata that you're interested in. Uh, you can choose by whether or not we're in you're interested in uh, complete genomes or partial genomes. Um, so for my case, for my use case, I only want all of the complete genomes that are there, and that's 277. Um, you can choose the specific country that you're interested in. If you're only interested in isolates from a specific country, um, a geographic group, um, Asia or Europe, which is where um, uh, this, this virus is most widespread. Um, if you're looking to study the virus based on a specific host, again, you can choose this. And um, let's say you only want viruses that have historically infected humans. Um, and if, you, if, if you're interested in uh, other things as well, you can explore by clicking on this gear button, uh, the other fields that we have available, and there's quite a long list. And so once you've selected um, what you want, you can also customize how you view um, the metadata in this table by clicking on uh, this plus button on the top right corner over here. And um, it's actually quite an impressive list uh, so that you can customize the metadata that you want to see and customize the, the metadata that you want to download as well. So if you just scroll down, for example, uh, let's say I'd like to see um, the scientific name of uh, the host that these viruses are transmitted in. I would scroll down to the host info subsection and click on um, the host name. And so this adds um, the host name that's provided in GenBank for each one of these. Um, and we also have the host common name. And another thing that we do is um, the host group. So let's say, for example, I'm interested in um, whether or not um, these particular viruses were isolated in ticks or humans. I might not want to scroll through the entire um, list of scientific names and figure out whether uh, Ixodes rhynchus and uh, um, another type of uh, scientific name are both ticks. I can just go to host group and select uh, just ticks. So this is quite useful uh, and I find that it helps save time. So let's say, for example, um, I'm interested in all of the tick-borne encephalitis viruses that have been um, collected in the last 20 years, because it seems that the more divergent um, tick-borne encephalitis viruses have mostly been uh, newer isolates. So I can click on, um, let's say, um, a particular collection year or I can use the advanced search button uh, to click on um, a specific uh, metadata um, title that I'm interested in. So for example, um, let's see where it would be, the host collection year and specify that I'm only interested in uh, viruses from um, 
the year 2000 to the year 2022 and click on search. And so that gives me a list of uh, 115 results. Um, and you can find out more about the individual uh, isolate by just clicking on it. And this populates this, um, this tab on the right where you can see all of the information um, that's either been imported from GenBank or added by our own curators um, to the database. And it's divided into uh, several subsections, for example, taxonomy, um, strain information, um, whether there's any information on the sequencing platform, which can be relevant um, for people doing particular kinds of studies, um, whether or not it's been annotated or not, um, and more information on um, how it was isolated, when it was isolated, where, and um, of course, the host information subsection. So if you'd like to um, select more than one of these, you can, of course, go through it just by clicking one or the other, or you can um, hold down the shift button, uh, which I found quite useful, and just um, scroll down and uh, click on as many as you want. Uh, all of these columns are sortable. So let's say, for example, you want to order it by collection year. You can just go ahead and click on that. Um, and of course, if you want to widen the table, you can click on this uh, hide button to toggle the details panel out of the way. And again, as I mentioned, you can customize this metadata table and add or hide as many columns as you're interested in. For our use case, I'm going to select all of these genomes and um, go ahead and uh, group these because I want to uh, save them as a group and um, be able to align them and then make a tree out of them eventually. So I can click on group button. And so this gives me a little pop-up uh, that shows um, and gives me the option to either save it to an existing group or save it to a new group. And then another thing pops up uh, with this little file icon and um, this allows me to select where I want this uh, information saved. Uh, every user account has a default folder for genome groups. And these are basically just a collection of um, all of the genomic or nucleic acid sequences uh, that you want to keep together for later analysis. So in my case, I've made a specific folder called flaviviruses and ticks. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And we can call this um, anything that we want. So let's say tick-borne encephalitis virus. Um, one. And you can go ahead and click on add. And so this will take a couple of seconds, but down here you'll get a little pop up that tells you your group was created. We also have uh, another option, um, another type of data set called a feature group. And this is usually how you would want to save the proteins rather than the nucleic acids. So if I switch to the protein tab, um, this will show me the different proteins that are associated with um, the genomes that I had um, uh, previously selected. Oh, and one more important thing I forgot to show you. Uh, so now that we've selected that we only want complete genomes and that we only want them um, for a specific date range, um, if you want to see the proteins only for this um, subselection, you do have to click the apply button. Otherwise, um, it will show you the proteins from the entire tick-borne encephalitis virus uh, collection. So now when I switch to the protein tab, instead of um, showing me all of the results, it's going to be um, only 14 uh, proteins. And uh, the annotation also depends on whether you're looking at the internal annotation, which uh, right now is uh, called Patrick, or whether uh, you want the annotation from uh, that was imported from GenBank um, under the RepSeq tab. And then when you look at the feature type column, um, different things are can be annotated, including um, RNA elements 
as well as uh, proteins, which are coding sequence features um, and mature peptides. So uh, not only can you find information on that one long polyprotein chunk, but we also use peptide uh, prediction tools to give you um, to give you an idea of uh, where exactly these smaller mature peptides that have been cleaved from that polyprotein are. And so let's say I want to save a subsection of these. I can go ahead and click on those. And um, I can also click group over here. But in this case, it's going to tell me that I'm saving it as a feature group, um, which would include the proteins rather than the genomic sequence. So, I hope that gives you an idea of how to browse for the different kinds of information that you can find. And I would encourage you to also explore these other tabs that contain information on protein structures, uh, specific different structural domains and um, conserved motifs that you might find, um, specific immune epitopes if you're interested in those, um, and so on. Um, but next, I'd like to move into um, how you can um, analyze this data now that you have it. Um, <clears throat> so you would go ahead and click on tools and services, and you'll find a list of the different tools here that you can use to analyze your data. Um, and because we do have uh, specific tools for analysis of bacteria and specific tools for analysis of viruses, um, you might want to uh, pay attention to this little uh, B or V uh, that's found after um, each tool. And the B specifies a tool that might be mainly used for bacteria. In some cases, it can be adapted to viruses, but initially it was uh, optimized for bacterial. Um, and then, for example, we have our SARS-CoV-2 genome and assembly annotation tool. And obviously this one would be uh, restricted only to viruses. Um, but things like a multiple sequence alignment tool um, is something that you can use for both bacteria um, and viruses. So that has um, no letters after that. So that just gives you um, a little bit of a hint on how to kind of navigate through the tools and services on the site. Um, and at the top of each page, you'll find a little summary explaining what this tool is about. Uh, so if you want to browse through the different tools and just explore what they are, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And for each one, we also usually have a quick reference guide to just give you a quick idea of what these buttons and um, different parameters are that you might have to select. Um, and it's really useful if you're not familiar with the terminology of um, the new site, especially if you're coming from uh, the Viper side of um, the website. And you can also uh, find a link for a tutorial that will help walk you through uh, in more detail how to use a specific tool. So this service combines uh, a couple of different things. One of them is just making a multiple sequence alignment. Um, so you could start with unaligned sequences, but it also um, looks at and um, <clears throat> gives you an idea of the variation or single nucleotide polymorphisms um, that you can also find in a multiple sequence alignment. So you can also, if you already have, have a multiple sequence alignment um, on your own computer, upload that over here and just use that for a SNP analysis. Um, and then you have different types of data that you can input. You can um, select a feature group if you're interested in uploading um, uh, protein information, or you can uh, select a viral genome group if you want to input um, the entire viral uh, nucleic acid genome, which is what I'd like to do. So to find that, you can either start typing. Um, so I would put TBEV but that's not gonna come up. Uh, so sometimes you might have to look for uh, your data by clicking on your folder and um, then navigate to the specific uh, subfolder uh, that you created. And in my case, I have my flaviviruses and ticks folder uh, that I created specifically for this uh, webinar. 
And over here, I have my uh, genomes, which are uh, the tick-borne encephalitis virus uh, from 2000 to 2022. Um, and in addition to these, I also added uh, one more genome uh, that was uh, an outgroup so that um, I can just have a better idea of uh, what's there. So I can click on OK if I'm happy with that. Uh, but if you also want to upload your own information, you can. You don't have to stick to information uh, from the website. You can also click on the upload button and then just select your file or just drag it into this box uh, to upload that. Um, if you're looking to create a specific folder and then upload, you can use this button. Uh, but again, we already have the file here already ready and prepared. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on OK. Um, you can choose the specific kind of aligner that you want. Um, my preference today is using the MAFT aligner, but we also have the muscle aligner available. And then the last thing you have to do is just um, write down or input the information for um, where you want um, the output files from this job generated. So again, I can go ahead and click on my uh, flaviviruses and ticks folder and then just give this a name. For example, multiple sequence alignment to form this colitis virus. And then uh, once all of the information is there, this grayed out submit button should become available to click. And you can go ahead and click submit. If everything is OK, um, it should tell you that your job has been submitted successfully and that you should check the job list uh, to find out what, when or how your job is done. So you might think, OK, how do I find out where my job is now? Um, so if you're not familiar with this site, there's a couple places you can go to do that. You can click on workspaces and click on my jobs. Or if you've been paying attention, um, you'll see this little box down here and you'll notice that that changed as soon as I click the button. Um, so this gives you, um, these two boxes give you a summary of what's happening on the, the site. This tells you the status of the files that you're uploading. Um, and if you've uploaded something, It'll tell you whether it's still uploading or whether it's been successfully uploaded. And over here, uh, it'll give you an idea of how many jobs that you have that are either queued in gray, that are running in yellow, or that have completed in green. And if you just go ahead and click on that, that takes you uh, to a list of um, your job statuses. And you can go ahead and click on uh, the one that you're interested in uh, to, see, uh, to see your results. So this gives you quite a long list of files sometimes. Um, and again, if you're not familiar with uh, these file extension names, you can definitely go through our um, <clears throat> reference guide and tutorials so that you can understand what these different out output uh, files are. But we also understand that people just want to see their uh, results. And you know, most people who want multiple sequence alignment know what a multiple sequence alignment looks like. So you can just go ahead and click on this uh, quick view uh, icon to view um, your multiple sequence alignments. This opens up a new tab over here, uh, which launches our multiple sequence alignment viewer. Uh, and you can scroll up or down um, you can click on a specific um, sequence that you're interested in, and you can move this around to kind of get an idea of how good uh, your alignment was. So for example, um, at the beginning of the alignment, we have uh, several genomes that are missing the first uh, 100 or 150 uh, nucleotides. So you might want to trim this alignment before you uh, move further on with your analysis. Um, over here, we have a few different buttons um, you can use to change the color scheme of these um, of this alignment. And I would again encourage you to explore these because there's quite a few interesting things over here. For example, um, you can look at different structural um, aspects of these um, nucleic acids. Uh, you can also use uh, filters to show different columns, depending on whether or not you're interested in columns that do or don't have gaps in them, or you just want to look at conserved sequences. 
And again, you should, um, if you have some time, just play around with those. Um, and you can also switch uh, the ID type. So if you look over here, these names might not make that much sense to you. And that's understandable. These are our internal uh, database names, but you can switch these um, to anything that you want, um, whether it's the genome name, for example, or the accession or the species or the strain. Um, and that sometimes helps to really give you an idea of uh, what types of viruses are maybe um, transmitted by a specific uh, uh, host or specific um, in a specific geographical area. So again, I also encourage you to play around with those. Um, and finally, you can also um, play around with the different visualization options uh, that show you the conserved weight, for example, um, of, the of each single position and so on. And then um, if you just want to download that, you can either uh, save a particular image um, by clicking the download button over there. Let's say you're interested, for example, in this particular uh, residue over here in this uh, block of Gs and how many sequences have that, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but going back to uh, the list of the files, one other thing I'd like to point out is the SNP analysis. Um, and that's the snip.tsv uh, file over here. And you can find that or view that by clicking on it and then clicking on the view button over here to see it in the browser. You can also download it and open it up in Excel to, um, to, to see what's there. But um, this will give you an idea of uh, what's found at each position. It will give everything a score. It will show you the consensus um, of each position and the number of sequences that contain uh, that particular residue over there. Um, so now that I have my multiple sequence alignment, uh, the next thing I wanted to do was to make a phylogenetic tree out of this. Um, but you, it's not necessary for you to go through uh, the alignment step first. You can just go straight to making a gene tree, and this tool will make the alignment for you, then generate the tree. So again, over here, uh, you have the option of choosing whether you want your input to be DNA or protein. Um, and as I mentioned, you can add aligned sequences or you can have unaligned sequences. Um, and if you already have your data in the, in the database um, or saved as a feature group of proteins or a genome group, uh, you can go ahead and add that over here. And um, so in this case, again, I'm going to choose my tick-borne encephalitis viruses from 2000 to 2022 and click on OK. Um, and it's important that you click on this plus button uh, so that it gets added uh, to the feature or file table that can be aligned. <clears throat> Over here, you can specify uh, the alignment parameters. And because I noticed that, um, let's say maybe the first hundred or so um, bits of, um, or the first hundred or so nucleotides of my alignments were missing in some genomes, I'm gonna go ahead and click on 0.1% uh, to trim uh, the first 10% um, ends of my alignments. And you can also choose um, whether or not you'd like to uh, remove specific columns that have uh, more than a specific percentage of gaps. So again, I'm also gonna click on 0.1%. Uh, and then you can choose what kind of tree you'd like to build. So over here, we offer two maximum likelihood trees, uh, Raxamel or Fiamel. <clears throat> but since I'm in a bit of a rush today, I'm just gonna click on fast tree, uh, which kind of will just give you a quick overview of um, the structure of your tree. Uh, I would recommend that you use uh, Raxamel or Fiamel for uh, if you're trying to generate a tree that's um, for publications. You can also choose your specific uh, substitution model. Um, 
<clears throat> over here if you um, would like to do that. And again, the last thing that you do is just specify the output folder. Um, and so I've got my three virus and text folder, and then I'll put the three. And click on submit. Again, it tells me that it's creating the tree and it's been successfully submitted. <clears throat> I can go down over here and see that um, the job is running and it's been completed. Um, but because this takes a little bit of time, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click on a pre-computed tree um, that I made yesterday so that we can um, take a look at that. And so I can find what I'm looking for depend based on um, the type of tree, the type of service that I made. And over here, it's the gene tree. And I'll go ahead and click on that. And again, it gives me a list of different output files that I can explore. Um, but if I'm just interested in taking a quick look at the tree, I can again go up to the top right here and click on this view button. And this will launch um, the tree viewer. So it might take a couple of seconds to load, but uh, be patient, uh, it usually does. Um, <clears throat> So here we have our tree starting to load. Um, and sometimes uh, it can be a little bit glitchy, but we're working on that. So you can just uh, refresh the page. It's taking a little while. And here is our beautiful tree. So um, if this tree viewer is new to you, uh, it can take a little um, time to learn all of the different uh, buttons and options that are available. But I would encourage you to explore it because it is actually a really rich tool uh, that gives you so many different options for not only viewing this tree, but manipulating it um, with different colors and different shapes so that you can um, really find <clears throat> um, the, the perfect tree for your publication or to help you understand or help other people understand what it is that you're looking at. Uh, so there's a lot to take in here, but um, if you look on the left side, you can change uh, or customize the information that's displayed here. So I can unclick uh, node name and that takes off the internal ID. Uh, you can choose whether or not you want to view the collection year. And that's something that I'm always interested in um, to see if there's any uh, correlation with uh, time. So you can click on collection year and that shows you the year the virus was isolated. Um, you can click on a geographic group and that will show you whether it was isolated from Europe or Asia. Um, now, that's not that interesting to me. I, I'd rather look at um, which country it was isolated from. So I can click on that, and that uh, populates Russia over here for me. But I'm finding this information a little bit um, hard to see over here. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to take off uh, the confidence uh, level for that. And that helps me see the structure of the tree and the individual branching a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> so if I want to zoom in on a specific branch, I can also uh, use the zoom buttons to um, either zoom in vertically, which um, will kind of expand the compressed branches of the tree, or I can zoom in uh, horizontally, which uh, also helps me expand it if um, I need to do it that way. And if I want to go back, uh, to, to and reset the tree to the initial view, I can go ahead and click on fit and center. And if you just, if you're not sure what any of these buttons do, you can just hover over them and it'll tell you 
uh, exactly what their function is. So I've gone ahead and reset that. Um, you can um, change the label size if you're having trouble seeing it. Uh, you can change the, the node size. You can change the branch width. Um, it's really nice to be able to have all of these options to customize it. Um, but one of the things that uh, I like most about um, this tree viewer is that you can colorize it um, depending on the metadata that's available in uh, the website. So for example, we've got uh, the collection year that you can color by um, the, the geographic group, the host group, the isolation country, the species. Um, and because um, from what we know about tick-borne encephalitis virus, we know that um, it's, it's the, the main groups are dependent on uh, the countries that they're from, I'm going to color it by isolation country. And so this really helps us visualize those three main branches that um, we first discussed when we were talking about tick-borne encephalitis virus. Down here towards the bottom of the tree, we have our European group. And we can see that most of the samples do in fact come from uh, European countries. We've got Denmark, the UK, Finland, Germany, uh, Hungary. And then over here, we can see our, um, <clears throat> our Siberian uh, group, most of which come from uh, Russia and, um, or at least uh, Siberian areas in Russia. And then up here, we've got our Far Eastern group, which uh, includes species from Russia uh, and China. And then we also have uh, those few groups um, those few divergent groups that we talked about that don't fall in between any of these uh, well-defined groups, such as these two from uh, Russia over here, this one that was isolated from Tibet in 2013, um, <clears throat> or the Tibetan Highlands. Um, and then we've got uh, this strange one from Austria uh, and a couple other uh, more divergent ones down here. Um, if you want to zoom into a particular uh, node, you can click on that node and you can either collapse it if you're not interested in it, or you can go to the subtree uh, to zoom in on it and um, look at uh, the branches in more detail. So you can see, for example, that there's a particular cluster that is restricted in this group mainly to Russia, whereas these are uh, more commonly found in China. And again, you can um, download your trees as uh, pictures, as NUIC trees, as file XML trees, um, and use these for your publications. Um, and so finally, uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you real quick, um, and I'll try and get this done so we still have some time for questions, um, is our MetaCats tool. And this one is a metadata-driven comparative analysis tool. And what this does is helps you look at um, whether there are positions either in the nucleotides or a protein that differ significantly uh, based on uh, either groups that you've chosen or uh, groups that are autogrouped uh, based on the metadata that's available in the database, such as the geographic location, uh, the specific country, or when the sample was collected. So I thought it might be interesting for us to compare whether there's any specific um, differences in the envelope protein of these three different groups, the Siberian, Far Eastern, and the European. So I went ahead and uh, pre-assembled uh, feature groups for these three different uh, subgroups of tick-borne encephalitis virus. Um, and using our protein search, um, I collected just the envelope protein for those. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put our output folder as our flavivirus and ticks and put metacats demo. And because I already know and I've already made my own feature groups based on those three particular tick-borne encephalitis groups, um, I'm going to go ahead to the folder where I saved them and click on group one, which is the Far Eastern um, group envelope proteins. Add that. Go ahead and click on the Siberian one. Add that. And finally, um, the European envelope. 
proteins. And always remember to click the plus button to add it. So now I have my three groups. And what this tool is going to do is compare them and identify any amino acid sites that are significantly different uh, between the three groups. So you can go ahead and click on submit. Um, and then again, just in the interest of time, I've already pre-calculated this. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. This gives me um, a couple of different output tables um, showing the statistical significance of each site. I'm going to click on first row contains the column headers to populate this table. Um, and it's, this shows me every single position for the envelope protein, um, which is goes from, um, it's a quite a short protein. It's only about 200 amino acids. It shows me the chi-square value, uh, the p-value, so anything um, over 0 0.5, which is what I set in the parameters, would be considered significant. And over here, it tells me whether or not um, it was above or below that threshold. Um, it shows the degrees of freedom. And again, I would encourage you to read the documentation to understand what each one of these are. Um, and these are my three different groups over here, but it can be tedious to just scroll through these. Um, if I'm only interested in just the significant positions, I can go ahead to um, uh, the keywords over here and use, um, click on significant and say that I only want the ones that have a Y um, or a yes for significance and filter those. And this shows me uh, the positions. So for example, at position um, 88 in that protein, um, I've got um, in, in one of these groups, most of them have a serine, whereas um, in this particular group, most of them would have a, a G in that position. And you can use these to develop diagnostic PCR primers, um, to, to do immunological studies, to find specific epitopes that you might be interested in uh, exploring. Um, and there's, there's many different applications to using these tools. And it's a really useful and very powerful way of uh, finding uh, what really defines a particular protein or uh, nucleic acid from a specific group. So I will stop there because we're almost at the end of the hour and uh, open it up for questions. That was really nice, Anna. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Um, I can I can start off with a question maybe until people get warmed up if they have sure. questions. I no just problem. quickly, I'm sure this came up in a previous webinar, but how many sequences can you actually align? Is there a limitation to that? And uh, or is the sky the limit? Right. Um, so it, it really depends um, because bacterial and viral pathogens differ so much in terms of their size. I mean, you have a 10 KB RNA um, virus, you know, or you have, uh, you know, a 400 uh, thousand base pair of plasmids, you know, it's not going to be the same in terms of uh, your input data size. So we're really trying to find the sweet spot and kind of customize it for each species. So it's it really depends and uh, we're still working on it. But we're trying to find a solution that makes sense for every uh, species. Right, yep. So we won't allow you to, for example, align whole bacterial genomes, but you can align whole viral genomes. Okay, so in the meantime, I will, um, well, while we're seeing if we have any more questions, um, I'll just mention that if you want to find out more, uh, we do have a lot of instructional videos on YouTube showing you kind of how to just navigate through the sites and the different tools. Um, we had a webinar series kind of introducing the BVBRC. Uh, we do have a lot of written tutorials and guides. Um, we also have a help desk. Um, and lastly, if you want to just keep up with us and what we do, you can follow us on social media. Um, this is our Twitter handle, uh, where you can find us on Facebook. And if you just have any general questions or want to discuss things relating to the BVBRC, or at all the BRCs actually, 
Uh, you can also uh, find us on our subreddit, BRC users, and just um, start a discussion. And if you're having trouble with the site, um, you can go to um, our About tab and click on Contact Us. That opens up a pop-up and you can say, you know, hey, uh, I love your site. Thank you so much. Uh, or, you know, hey, I don't like your site. Um, where's the old one? Or, you know, I'd like to help you improve the site and give us a suggestion. Or, you know, I think this particular data type would be really useful for you to add. Um, so, you know, please feel free to send us your feedback. We really try to um, gear this towards our users and we do listen to what you say. So um, please do share with us if you have a problem or if there's any feature that you particularly like or dislike or think you can help us improve anything. All right, well, if there are no more questions, then I just want to thank you all so much for uh, showing up and listening. And I appreciate your attention. And again, uh, if you missed anything or would like to see this again, uh, this has been recorded and we will post it on our uh, social media channels and on our websites shortly. Stay on for another minute. Otherwise, thank you all for your attention. All right, Anna, I think I'll go ahead and end this and then I'll uh, put the YouTube up as usual. So. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, no more. Nice Thank job. You, everyone. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.